Hi, it's Bruce, the part-time prospector. In this video, I want to walk through the key, the five key things every amateur gold prospector should know about reading geological maps to help you find more gold on purpose rather than just by luck. Reading a geological map can unlock a whole new world of gold finding potential. While they may be confusing at, at first, these maps are a powerful tool for understanding what's under your feet and where the gold might be hiding. So let's break this down into five key areas that you need to concentrate on. So let's get started. I'm using the trial about application here, but you can use most online applications to achieve the same thing. And here we'll be looking at the area around Kulgadi. Now I have to navigate on my tablet, which is plugged into my computer. So for those who don't know, Kulgadi is down here, Perth is over here, and the rest is Western Australia. So I'm using that because it's just got some interesting geology and for no other reason than that. And most people have heard about Kulgadi. Okay, so let's zoom in here. Now on the um, trial about application, they have a thing called simple geology, a simple geology map, which is great. And for most people, that's more than enough. But there's, you may have noticed that there's more than one type of map you can download. And when you do download them and swap back and forth, you may find them very confusing and different. One is a basement geology map, and the other one is a surface geology map. And you may ask, what's the difference? A basement geology map is if they take the, the surface of the earth and you got a huge big broom and you swept all the soil and regolith off the top, everything gone, all the surface stuff gone. So it's just down to straight hard rock at the bottom. And you basically scrubbed it clean. That's what a basement geology map would show you. A surface geology map shows you actually what you would see on the surface if you walked between point A and point B. You're sometimes going to come across transported soils, a river plain, some rock sticking out of the ground, maybe back into soils, maybe sand dunes, whatever, salt lakes, everything. That's what you see on the surface. And that's what a surface geology is. Now, simple geology on Trollobot, and I'm turning it on now, just to go to simple geology, is a surface geology map. Okay, so let's zoom in to, let's scroll across to, oops, where's the, so, um, there we are. Okay. So this is a surface geology map. Now it may look all very confusing at first, but once I show you what some of the colors mean and how to interpret what they mean, it will start to make more sense to you. Okay. First thing is the different colors represent different types of rocks. And so the easiest thing to look at first is that most of the yellowy color rocks are overlaying soils and some sort of maybe transported material, maybe windblown, maybe alluvial channels, but it's not rock. Basically it is the soft stuff on top, the stuff that trees grow in. You can. So if we zoom in further, and I'm just getting down to about here somewhere, for no particular reason, just because it looks pretty. You'll notice that there's the, the, the colored polygons representing the various rock tops have now got a symbol inside them. And hopefully you can see my mouse moving up here. We've got AS down here. We've got AF over here. We've got AG. Down here, we've got QT, QD, and everyone's favorite CZL. Okay. What do those letters mean? You'll notice that everyone starts with an uppercase letter and the rest are all lowercase. Okay. This is the, basically the convention for geological rock codes and soil codes. The first letter represents the age of the material. So if it's got an A at the front, it means it's Archean. This is ancient stuff. We're talking two to four, maybe even 4.5 billion years old. Yeah, that's with a B, not an M, a B. 
So basically 2,000 to 4,500 million years old. This is old stuff, some of the oldest stuff on the planet. Then you've got the Qs. They basically stand for the quaternary. And that is things that have been floating around for um, a lot less. And we're talking tens of millions instead of billions of years. And then you've got the seas out here for Cenozoic, which is again is an, again, a lot earlier, a lot, sorry, a lot later. And again, we're talking in the, in the sort of tens of millions of years old. So most of the soil here is old. So let's, the way to get more information out of this is by just taking your trusty old finger and tapping on one of the polygons. I'm going to tap one where it says AF and boom, up it pops up the little box and it says, this is an Archean felsic volcanic. It's 4,000 to 2,500 million years old. So. So 4,000 to two and a half thousand million years old. So if you want to find a bit more information, you can click, click on the bit where it says tap for more info and up it comes with some information. This is basically saying the age, the rock, a uh, description. It's a quartz felt spars, porphyry, porphyritic, microgranites, rhyolite, dacites, rhyodacites, andesites, blah, 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 blah. Basically they're felsic rocks. Okay. All good. No problems. So that's the first one out of the way. So then if we click on the QDs, for example, I'll make sure I click on it. This is saying this is a quaternary dunes and sand plains with dunes. Okay. 2.6 million year olds to now. Much, 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 much younger stuff. This is, you know, like yesterday's type stuff. And then if we went to the CZL, okay, this is Cenozoic. Laterite and or ferruginous dewy crust. Basically iron ridge, soils, um, hard cap. That's where you know, many people love to go gold prospecting. And you can see the age in that one. So this is about 40 million years older than the quaternary stuff. And this is, was first going down roughly about the time that the asteroid came in and killed all the dinosaurs. Okay. Stuff's been around, sitting on the top for a very, very long time. So that's how you can read the labels on it. So the purple stuff out here is mafic intrusives. And down here, we've got S's, we've got Archean sediments. So I'm scrolling across a bit. So you can see where Kalgoorlie itself sits. The red squiggly line, um, running, oops, where's my mouse? Over here, running along through here and down here. Basically, these are marker beds in sediments showing how they've been folded. And so this information out here is actually quite good. This is uh, Archean mafic, ultra mafic intrusives. One of the things is that, and this, and I'm getting on to the second point now, is that gold loves to hang out in in preference in certain rocks versus others. It loves iron rich environments. If you've got an iron rich environment and gold fluids are passing through, usually in a fault, fault zone, shear zone, etc., then you're more than likely going to get gold precipitating out. So how do you know which one is the iron rich ones? Basic, basically, the key word for most beginners is concentrate on mafic rocks and concentrate on banded iron formations. So anyway, you see this, the word iron or mafic, basically meaning iron rich environments and the, the mafic are basically the dark, almost completely black rocks. So that is some of the, um, things to concentrate on. So you can see in this area here, this whole zone here, there's a lot of mafic floating around. Now, if we go along here and tap on and turn on the gold deposits. What do you take the gold deposits for? Oh, boom. It's right in the middle of the matrix. Okay. As I mentioned before, 
and this is like we're moving on to point uh, three and four, is gold loves to travel along in, in structures. So the gold, let's recap it back a bit, take it back a step. Gold does not travel itself. Gold comes up in fluids. And a fluid can't travel through rock. It's just too hard. Okay. So the vast majority of times, the, the rock has to be fractured first. And this is usually like as a result of an earthquake or some sort of seismic activity. Huge masses of pressure applied to a rock or a whole continent in the case of Australia. And the rock is absolutely smashed to bits. These cracks then develop through the, through the crust. And the longer the, the crack is, in our case, we're looking for faults. We call them faults, fault zones. The longer a fault zone is, the base, the more deeper it goes. And the deeper a, a fault zone goes, the more the liquids can come up through the, through the rock. So these rocks, the, these fluids are coming up. So they're now looking, I'm mean, assuming they've got intelligence as of looking, but if they encounter the correct temperature pressure conditions and chem chemical conditions. So if they encounter a place where the pressure drops off slightly, temperature's down a bit, and they encounter potentially iron rich rocks, then there's more chance of gold coming out. Now, as the rock cracks, it doesn't crack in a perfectly straight line. It's zigzagging all over the place. Okay. And so as it encounters other hard bits of rock, it runs around it, all this sort of stuff. So as the rock cracks and, and bends the, and the fault bends, sometimes the faults can actually open up. This causes the pressure drop Boom, gold can form there. In other places, the reverse happens. The rocks get crushed together even tighter. Pressure increases up, goes up. Gold does not precipitate out there. The, the, the fault continues out of the mafic rocks, goes into some of the felsics, goes into other types, granites, for example. Not that favorable for gold precipitation. Okay. And so the gold just keeps on moving through the system until it finds the next favorable conditions to precipitate out. So what we're looking for is the conjunction of faults, change in directions of faults, or even nicer if we can find faults with mafic rocks, with faults that intersect each other, then we know that we've got the right chemistry and we've got faults that are potentially bringing fluids. And if they intersect another fault, then there's a, a cavity can get formed and gold can precipitate out in that zone there. So if we have a look around here, I'm just going to turn the, the gold off on this one then and zoom out of it. You can actually see, oops, I thought I took the gold off. Uh, no, well then. So you can actually see with these dotted lines all the way through here, this is the faults running up through the area. Now you may notice that in some parts of these of these faults that the lines are solid and then other bits that dashed and then they become solid again and so on like that. And then they disappear and they may or may not form again. And you get bits like it just sit out in the middle of nowhere. What does that mean? Okay. The solid bits mean whoever interpreted and drew that fault had high confidence. The fault structure was actually there. Now they could maybe see it on the ground. They could see it in mine workings. They could see it through drilling interpretation, et cetera. It was very clear. And then you may find that they've got another clear signal, for example, down here. So they've got a, a, a signal, a, a indication of the fault. So they may say, well, I think the same fault continues all the way from down there through here, but we can't be guaranteed that it's there. It may wonder about, may not even be there. Um, because it's gone under all this transported material sitting on top of it. So they put a dash line, basically meaning it's inferred. It's, there's no great confidence in here. And it continues to look, the, the inferred line continues down here, and then they have confidence again, and then they appear to lose it. Some of these bigger faults out here, for example, may only be interpreted from aeromagnetics, and that can be interpreted at various scales. And so if they, 
working on core scale maps, then they may say, well, I'll actually just put this down as an inferred line because it can't be absolutely certain where it is. That's another thing to think about with scales of maps, because not everything is mapped at the highest quality. So we shouldn't say quality because everything's done the good quality at the highest possible resolution. So sometimes data is collected at, especially if it was collected decades ago and geological mapping, some of the stuff that was mapped more than 50 plus years ago is it might've been only collected on a regional scale. For example, say one to quarter of a million. So one is to 250,000 or they would map those areas first and then come back to the one to hundred thousand sheets and then do much more detailed mapping over that. But even at that scale, do you know what that one to hundred thousand means? It means that one centimeter on the map equals a hundred thousand centimeters on the ground. Now, a hundred thousand centimeters is one kilometer. Okay. So there's a lot of, you know, and you have to be out by a little bit and you're out by a huge amount in real life. And if you're mapping a quarter, um, quarter million stuff, you're basically looking at 2.5 kilometers per the centimeter. And so it becomes even worse and worse. So it's great to see these things on trilobards, GFU, 10 graphs, whatever. But, and when people start to zoom in like this and wonder if that fault and, and still believe because the map draws it as being right there, well, it may not be there because the scale bar down the bottom here, sorry, that was a bit itchy. Scale bar down the bottom here, you can see this is a two kilometer zone. So we could, this thing could be anywhere from there to basically out here or to be out here. So it could be quite a zone where that that fault could be in. So keep an eye on mapping and scales because they're not all, you know, collected to the nearest millimeter accuracy. So we're going back and just have a quick last look at the Kalgoorlie region. And you can see why Kalgoorlie is there. When you start looking at those colors and now the information, and it's only given you a taste of some of the information, you can see the colors now are starting to represent the, um, the promising rocks. So those purple rocks, the green rocks, the blue rocks, the pur pur I think I said purple. So those are the rocks that are the mafic rocks. And you can see they've been busted up by, by fault zones. So plenty of opportunity for potential mineralization. And if the, the fault system has been activated and reactivated and reactivated, and if fluids have been pumped up every single time, then there's a high chance that gold has pre precipitated out in at least some of those events. So use this as a guide in the future to try and find out where you think gold might be hiding. And please don't be frightened of your geological maps. They can be your best friend. I really, really hope you guys got some value out of this video. If you did, I'd love a thumbs up. I'd love it if a comment if you and what you think about geological maps. Maybe even post the comment geological maps inside the, um, the comment section. I would really appreciate it. Would it really help for the, um, the, the YouTube algorithm? And I'd love it if you could subscribe if you haven't joined already. Thanks everybody. See you in the next video.